Hello and welcome to The Drum. I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, one last whack from the Iron Bar. Wilson Tucky's farewell message to the man who took his seat. Another Australian sports star learns of the dangers of social media. And Google Alert, how a gay activist hijacked the online profile of a Republican presidential candidate. Our panel tonight, Will Anderson, host of The Gruen Transfer on ABC One. John Barron from ABC News Radio and in Melbourne, Chris Berg from the Institute of Public Affairs. Now, just in case you thought the Greens don't believe in spreading the love all around, today Bob Brown said he'd be happy to work with Tony Abbott to pass any coalition policies the Greens might approve of. The Greens have already said they favour the coalition's more costly paid parental scheme over Labor's. John, do you think this is putting the frighteners up Julia Gillard, this little comment this morning? It's, it's a fascinating prospect, of course. This all comes from the deal done with the independents that says that private members' bills now have to be heard and voted upon. So it opens up the possibility that anyone in the lower house can put forward another piece of legislation not originating from the government benches, and it could if they can win over Adam Bant's vote in the lower house and maybe an independent or two and then get it voted upon in the Greens-dominated Senate as of next July, that we could have a policy that is not Julia Gillard's policy, such as this more generous parental leave scheme, become law, technically. Raises all sorts of constitutional questions, and you wonder whether, in fact, this is just Bob Brown batting his eyelids a little bit at, uh, at Tony Abbott to make Julia jealous right now, but we'll just have to wait and see. Chris Berg, what impact could this have on the costings of uh, Labor's policies? <laughs> I think this will be a real surprise when, um, if policies get through, and that's by no means guaranteed if opposition policies get through, I think it will be a real surprise when Wayne Swan prepares his next budget um, to see that the cost might have blown out and that his budget is not really his budget. But uh, apart from that, I think it's actually a really exciting thing because I think this is a, a reminder but that we live in a parliamentary democracy and not just a, uh, we're not just overruled by an executive government. It's a reminder that legislation comes from Parliament, not just from government. And I think the, the dynamic that it's going to throw up is going to be... It's going to give a lot of lessons to the government of the day and I think it's going to give a lot of lessons to the Australian people about actually how our system works. Will, can you see Tony Abbott taking the bait from Bob Brown here? No, look, in a practical sense, you know, I mean, it's nice to talk about this, but this isn't going to happen because, you know, you've got to commit <laughs> yourself to a government where there's a budget and you can't come in with this, you know, thing that's going to cost all this other money and say, you've got to pay for this as well just because we like it, we're going to go over there. I mean, you've chosen your side. You've got remarried. You've got in the marriage <laughs> with Julia Gillard. You can't have an affair with Tony Abbott and expect Julia Gillard to pay for the affair. It just doesn't work like that. <laughs> Although, can, you see, uh, can you see Bob Brown being polygamous here, John? <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting. I, mean, I think Will's exactly right. And there are constitutional questions that say, look, at the end of the day, the Governor-General has to give her assent to, to any sort of money bill that turns into law, and she will only do that on the advice of the ministers of the day. But... Would Wayne Swan be brave enough to be the one to say, OK, I know both Houses of Parliament have just passed this much more generous parental leave scheme, but I'm not going to let her sign it. So that's, that's where it's going to be interesting. It could still happen with some bills, but, as Will says, it could also mess up the budget powerfully very quickly. Well, Canberra's been pretty quiet <laughs> for the past few weeks, but today, pollies of all persuasions, new and old, were back in the nation's capital. Labor's been meeting to decide who'll be up for front bench positions in their party, and the Liberals have reaffirmed their leadership team. For Tony Abbott, it was onwards and upwards. We have not become a government, uh, but we have made our country proud of the Liberal and the National parties. I think we have done ourselves proud uh, and we will do our country proud over the next three years. And as the opposition leader pointed out to the troops, one of the party's major achievements was the election of the youngest parliamentarian. Queensland's Wyatt Roy certainly seems mature beyond, beyond his 20 years. Well, how does any member of parliament deal with it? I think you just have to be yourself. You just have to be honest and, and, and accept. I think it's important to accept you will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can learn from those mistakes and be honest with particularly your electorate and the people that put you there, yep. um, that, that's my focus. Chris, quite an achievement, getting elected uh, to Parliament at the age of 20. It is, it is. And, and well, I mean, it's easy to mock the idea of such a young parliamentarian, but there's no reason to suggest that he can't get up to speed like a lot of other parliamentarians get up to speed. It's a very strange job and it has its own um, uh, quirks and, and the attention. What, one of the things I'm a bit, a, a bit saddened by is the fact that we don't get to see Wilson Tucky in the same party room <laughs> as Wyatt Roy. 
Um, I think that uh, you want to see a parliament that is diverse and um, representative of all ages. That certainly would have been one. White Roy, I think, was born in 1990. And, um, uh, and uh, Wilson Tucky was born in something like 1935. That would have been a real difference and it would have been wonderful to see them next to each it other. It sure would have. And we will mourn uh, Wilson collectively a little later in the show when we show some choice <laughs> grabs from that press conference. But, Will, he was mocked as the kind of the doogie hauser of, uh, <laughs> of uh, the Liberal Party, but he knocked off a quite more experienced guy in the Labor Party and he showed him up. Oh, yeah, look, I think it's cool. I, I'm a bit with Chris on this one, that I, I think, you know, that we shouldn't be mocking him because he's young. It's cool that young people want to engage in the political process and, and you know, I think it's, it's going to get more young people interested that this guy does and that, that he's from the conservative side of politics, I think, makes it even more interesting. I, I just love the fact that I have a pair of shoes that are older than a Member of Parliament. <laughs> I think it's great. <laughs> Man, John, I'm, I'm guessing in the Labor Party uh, room there would have been some strict messages from uh, Julia Gillard stay fit, stay healthy, yeah. uh, don't leak, <laughs> uh, no sex scandals. That would be pretty much what she would have said. It, it was interesting, the contrast between the two party rooms today, whereas there was a sense of triumphalism in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Liberal Party room. In Labor, it was more a sense of... It was almost like a, a, a survivors of trauma meeting, where everyone was sort of saying, <laughs> you made it through. Because, of course, there's about a dozen people that aren't there, that were there before the election, it, whereas it's welcome to new friends. In the Liberal Party room, it's like, good to meet you, including 20 uh, year like White Roy. So it's very interesting to see the contrast between the two that has uh, that has emerged now. But yes, Julia Gillard, she's going to be asking everyone, you know, how are you feeling? You're taking care of yourself. You're swim swimming enough laps, but not jogging. These yes. kinds of things. And I like how uh, it came out of the, uh, the. It was reported this afternoon from Caucus that uh, she said that she wanted Labor MPs to refrain from all leaks. Now, presumably, that was leaked from the Caucus room. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful irony, isn't it? it? Is. <laughs> Uh, there's some very interesting analysis too on Crikey today, Chris. I don't know if you saw that, where they were saying that uh, more than half of the new MPs and senators uh, elected on August the 21st were staffers or uh, party operatives or former or serving politicians. It doesn't seem like the gene pool has spread much. No, it's particularly bad uh, in the Labor Party, but I think it's actually worse than that um, stat, uh, stat suggests because particularly in the Labor Party, if you don't come from a staff or, or a union role, you're a lawyer. I mean, there are only... We counted uh, quite recently, we counted the amount of non-lawyers and non-staffers and non-union people in the Labor Party cabinet. We only found two. Tony Burke apparently worked in a shop... And, of course, Peter Garrett is Peter Garrett. You're sure that, didn't Garrett you're sure probably... that wasn't shop steward with just the steward bit missing? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he, he, he genuinely worked in a shop, and I, I'm told, and uh, I'm not sure how accurate this was, it might have been a KFC. But, um, <laughs> uh, and, of course, Peter Garrett. But Peter Garrett probably has the most private sector experience out of anybody in the Parliament, I suspect, outside of Malcolm Turnbull, perhaps. John, John so this I, is a I real problem for actually... the Labor Party, isn't it? <laughs> it, it? It's really interesting. I mean, you can look at this two ways and, and you can say, well, here, you know, here we've got a, a self-selecting group, people who are passionate about their politics. They're not pursuing the big bucks in life. They're wanting to get involved with politics and they, they join Young Liberal or Young Labor Party when they're at university and then they, they become staffers and they work diligently on campaigns. Maybe if they're on the Labor side, they work for a union as a, as a, as a, as a social you know, case office and all these sorts of things. Do you think, what a terrific bunch of people giving up 20 years before they even get a shot at Parliament? Or you can look at it and say, well, here are people that have not operated outside the party machine at any stage since puberty and they weren't even cool enough to join the chess club. I mean, these are the people getting involved <laughs> with student politics, for goodness sake. There is a, a career path, but a, there is a very real concern that, you know, in the old days, you know, Ben Chifley, he drove a steam engine. These people now, it's like, well, what have they done? And I think, Will, um, this point was made by Barry Cohen, the former minister in the Hawke government. He said when he first uh, went into caucus, he remembers shaking hands of other Labor MPs and there were fingers missing because they'd lost them in industrial accidents. <laughs> the Labor Party's moved a long way from that, haven't they? Yeah, look, and, and I think in, inbreeding is bad for the system, in any mm. system. I mean, yeah. you look at royal families, you know, if you do mm. too much inbreeding, it doesn't matter how good the thing you started with, after a few generations it gets less and less. I mean, it doesn't matter how hot, you know, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt are, <laughs> if their kids had kids with their kids and their kids had kids with their kids, eventually there would be problems and there would be fingers missing again I imagine. <laughs> and there is a certain amount of incest, well not quite, but mm. given that particularly on the Labor side, you've got a lot of people here who've known each other for 20 years, mm. who are now serving on the Federal Ministry together, who had affairs when they were in university. I mean there's a lot of that that goes <laughs> on and how this plays out we will probably never know uh, until they write their memoirs some years from now. Well. And there's, there's, a lot there's of that. certainly a lot of that going on. Chris, is the Liberal Party as bad when it comes to inbreeding? 
Um, no, not as bad. Um, I, I, a lot more people come out of they come out of the business world, particularly the banking sector and that sort of thing. They do have their fair share of staffers, though. We shouldn't be um, trying to uh, trying to whitewash over that. And I think the real concern with staffers is not so much that they come from the political system, but they might only really be interested in the political game. They might only really be interested in winning power rather than having real ideas about what they want to do in their electorate or what they want to do in government or in opposition. I think that's the concern, not so much where they come from, but what they plan on doing once they get there. And when we see so many staffers, we wonder, well, you know, why are you in this politics game at all? Well, let's talk about a former publican who turned Liberal MP uh, and today marked the political swan song of a colourful and often controversial member of parliament. Veteran Liberal Wilson Ironbar Tucky lost his West Australian seat of O'Connor in the election and today he held what the media thought could be his final news conference. But then again, maybe not. I want to point out to you I'm not retiring from politics per se. I want to be around the place. I might even start a blog. Because <laughs> I think I should still be able to inform people of my views on the issues that make quite a point from time to time. Now, Will, I'm not convinced that Wilson knows how to operate a computer, let alone run a blog, but is, is that a promise or a threat, do you think, from Wilson? Uh, I'd love to see it. I've got to be honest with you. I'm <laughs> going to miss Wilson Tucky. I think here at ABC24, we've got an opportunity. You get Wilson Tucky on just 24 hours a day. You could have a Tucky <laughs> channel here at the ABC. Just let him ramble endlessly on and on for people's amusement. Maybe we could put some other shows together. You know, we could have the Bush Tucky man. We just send him <laughs> out and about. He could do a Kylie Minogue parody, I Should Be So Tucky. We could really kind of make this a multimedia industry I think now that he's got all this spare time and all these ideas. Well I think that uh, press conference still could be going but John uh, he pointed out in that press conference that his primary vote was higher than Tony Crooks. He was yes. very upset about the preferential voting system. Yeah. Uh, he still seems angry. He still seems like he's got fire in the belly. He's raging against the dying of the light. He's not going to go quietly, Wilson. I think you're right. He's going to be blogging and, and just quietly, he, he rings up our radio station every other morning and often people pick up the phone and say, there's some crank on the phone. It's like, oh, oh Mr Tucky, just, just a moment. I'll, I'll get somebody for you. Uh, he, he, is, he is a unique character and I think with regards to our earlier conversation about how um, we're getting a sort of a white bread effect in, in both sides of politics. He's a colourful character that, uh, that we'll be reminiscing about soon enough, but I don't think he's going, he's going anywhere. Yes, he got 10% more than, uh, than Tony Crook did in the primary vote, but then again, 62% of the people in his electorate voted for somebody other than him, and uh, I think that that probably says something. Chris Berg, do you have a, a Wilson Tucky uh, career highlight you'd like to share with us? Well, there are so many, but I've actually really enjoyed the recent years